Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Lauren Gates. I'm your host of Airway Health Solutions Conversations, and we welcome back Dr. Ben Moralia. It seems like a while, right? It's been a whole two weeks since we've seen yeah, it, you. Yeah, I, I know. I feel like I was just on yesterday. Meanwhile, it was two I weeks know, ago. I know. <laughs> so, um, I hope everybody's doing well. Yeah. So we got a lot of uh, nice feedback from these conversations so far. So thank you everyone for your comments and your emails. We do appreciate that. So we'll keep this going as long there, as there's interest. And tonight's topic is a hot topic. It's uh, expansion with clear aligners. Hi, Dr. Phillips. <laughs> um, how are you? So it's gonna be another action packed hour. We have um, over 200 doctors registered again this week. So I'm really excited about that. And um, we have like 200 questions as well. So okay. uh, we're gonna do the best we can. And I'm sure you're gonna answer a lot of those questions as we go through. But if we have to ho host another one with the same topic, we'll do that. As long as there, there's interest, we'll keep coming. Yeah, so um, why don't we get started, Dr. Moralia, and just give everyone knows you so well, and they know you know, you're on online faculty, you've been educator of the year, you've won numerous awards, and you're probably one of the most requested, if not the most requested speaker for Align Technology. Why don't you give us a little overview of your journey specifically with Clear Aligners? Sure. So it began probably um, in 2003 or four. I, I forget now it's so long ago, but this has got to be 16, 17 years ago. And um, the whole thing was, uh, I was already into uh, restorative fixed crown and bridge implant related dentistry for a decade. So I'm 27 years into private practice. 10 years in, uh, we were talking about, you know, the ortho component with restorative cases, comprehensive care, and how so many adults were not interested in braces. So you've got this adult that you're thinking about ortho, perio, restorative, and you've got this beautiful comprehensive care case that you could be doing. They go off to the consultation and you might have a favorable periodontal consultation. You might have a favorable endo. You're going to have the ortho consultation, but that's the one where they come back and they say, you know, I saw, I understand, I see, but I can't wear braces. I, I don't want to do that. We had such a list of those people that all of a sudden it was the, well, what's the, what's, what is there for them? You know, why we can't do any ortho. Now we're, you know, we're doing restorative perio and, you know, cases on people who have malocclusions and crowding, but we're just not addressing the ortho when they refuse braces. One thing leads to another next thing, you know, I'm sitting in an Invisalign course that's taught by Dr. Lou Schumann at the time, mm -hmm. an early mentor of mine. And I left after that, at the time it was a two day program. I left that course uh, could not believe what I saw and learned. One thing led to another, and uh, at almost simultaneously, I'm looking for um, education and mentorship in expansive orthodontics because I, I knew I had the direction that I wanted to go, which was going to be wider and forward. In other words, develop the arches, correct malocclusion, deliver a healthy human being. So I, I had an idea. I just didn't have the pieces of the puzzle. And sure enough, one Invisalign class after the next, and then you're learning about the capabilities. You're trying the aligners on patients as you go. And the first thing you do is you put your family and your team members in it. So, you know, for me, that's like 50 people right. in the aligners. And sure enough, you start to figure it out and you build a puzzle and you realize how capable they are. And we're going to explore tonight how capable they are. And now, you know, fast forward 17 years of using clear aligners uh, through Invisalign as a, as a form of expansion. You know, um, it, it, aligners are an expansive device. And so when you think about the two worlds that exist, you know, you have expansive orthodontics and orthopedics and you have retractive in, in these two camps while they both exist, you know, um, your patients have options. And when you're thinking about the expansive camp, um, you have a wonderful opportunity with clear aligners. They're very capable of developing your arch width and can give you beautiful expansion. And so, you know, that it was a perfect match because I was looking for growth and development, expansion orthodontics and clear aligners, you know, fits in there beautifully. So here well, we are. that leads to um, the opportunity you have to treat with clear aligners because what is the most common malocclusion that we see? Yeah, so, so 17, 17 years, years of looking at uh, uh, TT with, 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 with the clear aligner, aligner, you know, eyes okay. and sure enough, enough there is uh, an ben, I'm just going to have you, um, your little jumbled here. It's we have a, a Zoom demon coming on. Oh. And so I, I think it's best to probably have you log off and log back on because your audio just went out. 
I'm going to log, log out. out. Yeah. Everyone sit, hold on one moment and um, it, it won't take long. This is the beauty of Zoom. <laughs> so um, thank you for your patience, everyone. And uh, you can use um, in the chat box, I believe, you can chat your questions if we have um, time, we will get to them. If not, um, we can certainly answer your questions from the chat uh, after this um, broadcast. So uh, if there are any hygienists watching tonight, I want to let them know that this is an exciting program as well because we see crowded malocclusion probably out of eight patients, I would say at least seven of them have some type of crowding. And many times the hygienist has the opportunity to, let's see if you're back, to uh, okay, bring so this to the attention. Locked back right. in. Now yes, see. so you're good. Can you hear me now? I was just, I was spilling in a little bit how the hygienists, um, if they aren't already looking for malcolm yeah. how they have such an opportunity to really be the forefront of this and drive this home because they're seeing it first. And if they Absolutely. overlook the conversation, it's very difficult for them, for the doctor to come backtrack and have to first present it. So oh, I was just kind of trying to give a little uh, tidbits there while we were waiting for you. But let's talk about the most common form of malocclusion and why that exists. Sure. So, you know, the, mo the most common, you know, type of malocclusion is the crowded malocclusion. And so when you think about crowding versus spacing, those are your two largest categories out there. There's crowded, there's spacing. Well, crowding exists a whole lot more than spacing. And so when we see the crowded malocclusion, which is super common, we, we would recognize in that category, there's another kind of category where there's a large majority and that would be in the deep bite. So when we think about the mouths that we look at, most of the malocclusions we see are the crowded deep bite variety. And so if you're keeping score, whether it's a day, a week, a month or a year, if you're keeping a little scorecard of what you're seeing, you're gonna have very few times where you notice uh, an adult that has a, a bite or a good occlusion like your typodont. In other words, if you've got your typodont in your hand and you look at it and you look at the patient in the chair, very rarely is the patient gonna walk in and show you that type of bite. Now, they're gonna show you different stuff. We certainly have cross bites. We certainly have open bites. We certainly have you know, all these other ways to describe different malocclusions, but all of the other ones are, are really outliers. So when you think about what you're going to see most of, most of the malocclusion is going to be the crowded deep bite variety. And since that's the overwhelming majority out there, we'd like to be prepared to treat that all the way to a beautifully uh, developed healthy occlusion so our patient can have a different future. It turns out that not only is the crowded deep bite the most common of all the malocclusions, it, it's the most destructive. And so that's the type of bite that deteriorates the, the fastest. And so you know, a human being who has all their teeth where they belong is if you have a beautiful type of like occlusion, it's very protective and it'll last you a long time. Basically, the mouth will deteriorate or age appropriately with a beautiful bite. But the moment you've got a crowded deep bite malocclusion, you would recognize changes more rapidly. So we find it in the gum tissue recession. We see it in the teeth, that fractions, wear of tooth structure, um, jaw joint issues. So the bone surrounding the teeth. So whether it's Tooth, gum, bone, or jaw joint muscles or dentistry we've done, when you think about anything in that mouth, it's going to age prematurely or deteriorate ahead of schedule. There's a number of ways to think about it, but the crowded deep bite does not go forward very well. And that mouth, because of the deterioration, is going to be a recurring dental patient that we're patching after patching after patching. And meanwhile, we have an opportunity to correct it, but the, the, the real pathway to correct a crowded deep bite is tooth movement. That, that's how you get your type it on back by tooth movement. So let's go ahead and take a, a look at a couple of crowded cases. I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. So uh, I'm a big fan of seeing is believing. I just wanna remind everyone that uh, please no personal audio recording um, of our slides that's uh, appreciated and under copyright. So let me go ahead and slide show. Um, yeah. Okay, terrific this. Okay, so tell oh, yeah. us a little bit about this case. Sure. So yeah, one of our favorite patients uh, came in almost 18 years old. He had never had orthodontics. He missed an opportunity when he was younger to be treated. And next thing you know, here he is uh, towards the end of high school. 
and concerned about his smile and his aesthetics and was looking for, of course, a nicer smile. Typically, that's where the patient's chief concerns are and the, you know, the aesthetics of things and or the comfort of things. But he wasn't having any pain, so we didn't have any pain to talk about. But when he comes in and has a very narrow, crowded malocclusion like this, so he has that narrow, crowded, deep bite malocclusion, we have an opportunity to help him out. And we recognize from the photograph on the right, he, it comes in with a little bit of overjet too. If you don't see it, just pretend he's got a little overjet. There it nice. is. Yep, nicest kid in the world. So he shows up with this. And so, you know, right away we had a, a junior in high school on our hands, which at, at the junior year in high school, you have missed your window to wear braces. And so he recognizes that he would like to improve his smile because this is not a smile that he's, you know, confident with and secure with. And sure enough, he's not interested in braces. And so braces aren't going to help him out during junior and senior year of high school either. And so if he's trying to, you know, fit in socially, he's looking for something like, you know, a clear aligner. And certainly we have Invisalign to, to work this out with, but he has a narrow improper arch form, improper arch width, improper inclination. You know, we could recognize that all of these teeth are collapsed in towards the tongue. It has a fair amount of crowding. You know, 229 is a very special tooth as you're gonna see in a couple minutes that uh, this, this nice young teenager was able to use Invisalign aligners one to the next without auxiliaries, without any elastics, without any extra type of you know, special treatments. It's just one aligner to the next. And we were able to teach him how to wear it, put him on, he followed all the instructions. And over time, what we're gonna recognize is that he went through all of his aligners one to last, and you're looking at the change here from the before to the after in that this is a 36 aligner count. He went from one to 36, and you're looking at the 36 aligners without a refinement. At the time it was refinement. This is this case is almost, uh, it's probably eight years old now, but this is going back a ways when we use the word refinement. So he wears 36 aligners, goes from one to 36. Again, no elastics, no auxiliaries of any kind, uh, and he goes, basically from what you're looking at on the left is the improper arch form at an improper arch width with improper buccal lingual inclination, a collapsed, crowded, deep bite malocclusion to a, you know, a wide open arch that has a beautiful arch form, a, an appropriate arch width, excellent inclination. The teeth are upright and vertical, so we can have good vertical load in the bite, and it changes the vault on them. So we get this beautiful dento-alveolar change where we would recognize a difference in what we call loosely the home for the tongue, or you know, we can call it, you know, in, in more professional words, we can talk about oral cavity volume. In other words, behind a beautiful set of teeth that's closed together is the chamber that the tongue lives in. And so, you know, the difference from one side of the screen to the other for a patient like this would be the difference between mouth breathing and nose breathing. So on the left side of the screen, when the tongue has no room, all of a sudden, when you have your teeth together and there's a smaller chamber to live in, we experience posterior displacement. And the, you know, the nice research that comes out of the sleep facilities shows that when you have a narrow, uh, when you have a narrow arch with a high vault, you have basically a reduced amount of space for the tongue, and basically your tongue is then posteriorly displaced. So the the look of the OSA patient is that it ha they have a narrow and vaulted maxillary arch. So when we think about our sleep breathing patients, we think about, well, is the vault narrow? Is the arch narrow and the vault high? And the answer is, of course, yep, there it is. And they use the word phenotype. And the fancy word phenotype means look. So when we think about the phenotype of the sleep disorder breathing OSA patient, it ends up being very consistently a narrow arch with a high vault. And in this particular case, where you also have a little bit of that overjet, he, can, he fails to have lip seal at rest. And so having your lip seal at rest and your tongue parked forward allows the air to pass by the tongue very nicely. So this is not only a change from having a, basically a, a horrific malocclusion that's gonna deteriorate ahead of schedule, all of a sudden what you have is a beautiful occlusion that will protect itself <clears throat> while it's eating all that good food he wants to chew, but also he gains a lot of room and a beautiful kind of you know full space for the tongue to live in. And if the tongue is living forward and high, the air passes behind it better. So not just bad occlusion to good occlusion, also mouth breathing to nose breathing. 
I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that I think is great while we have this slide up to reference yeah. to, because they're going, it's, it's an, it's an over uh, repeating question. Can adults maxilla be expanded with expanded with clear aligners? How much? And then also in expansion with aligners, are you getting bodily movement of the teeth or just tipping them? So this would be a good opportunity to address that. I yeah. Think. So when you're thinking about that narrow, improper arch form, improper arch width, typically the, the teeth are leaning towards the tongue. So a lot of times what you're looking at is a fair amount of crowding and a narrow kind of V-shaped arch with the teeth having excess lingual inclination. So the, the very first thing you're looking to do is upright those back teeth. And so uprighting is a significant accomplishment because you take teeth that are leaning lingual which then when they're closing, you're gonna get a lot of horizontal force on those teeth. Teeth leaning in, when they close and meet the upper teeth, all of a sudden there's a bending pressure. So we're looking to correct that excess lingual inclination. So having some uprighting is beautiful. This case, which is typical, this is not, this is not an outlier, this is typical. This is what clear liners deliver when the technique it put in place is, is correct. And then of course, when the compliance is delivered, this is what you would expect to find. And the amount of expansion, like sometimes the question comes in the way you read it, other times it's how much expansion. Well, how much expansion is, what does the patient need? And so the idea is we do use a transverse measurement to measure across the arch, you know, and he measures about 28 inches, uh, 28 millimeters across his arch. Now, when you have 28 millimeters across the arch, it's very narrow. When we get to the ending where all of a sudden, you know, this is, about eight millimeters uh, a change. And so when to go from 28 to 36 puts him in an, an average range because 35 to 39 is a nice range to be in where you have kind of good occlusion. So if you think about having a healthy bite, the credentials of the width are gonna be about 35 to 39 millimeters. Well, you basically have the opportunity to get the amount of expansion you need. And so some of the things that apply are gonna be, well, we, we would like to expand until there's no crowding. That's one consideration. The idea would be to do something like this without any interproximal reduction. So without polishing any teeth, this is a result where there's no IPR. So if we're not gonna do any polishing, then you go for full expansion. The idea here is, did you get mostly uprighting? Sure. Are the teeth now perfectly vertically placed? We'll have, well, obviously we'll have an anterior view in a second to see the vertical position. Do you get mostly uprighting with a little translation? It's all woven into one movement. In other words, these teeth are gonna go out to place. And so it's not robotic. In other words, we don't just upright teeth then slide them out like this, or we don't take teeth like this and slide them out, but then we'll tip them. It's not, it's not robotic, it's more of a smooth flow. So if teeth are like this, it's gonna be kind of a flow out. Now to go from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen, it's hard to imagine that that distance would be traveled with just tipping alone. So is it only uprighting? Is there some translation? It's probably a combination of. Once you have histology in the alveolus activated and moving along, you're gonna get some really nice natural tooth movement until these teeth are where they belong. So I'll probably say that you have the majority of this movement being uprighting because the teeth were very lingually inclined. And there's probably a little bit of translation, but it wouldn't be in a robotic move where it's one than the other. And so, what kind of percentage are we looking at? Maybe this is 75 to 90% of uprighting because the teeth was so lingually inclined. And then there's a, a, it could be a 10 to 25% of a translation movement in there. The idea is that the amount of expansion that the patient needs is the amount that's delivered. And so you're looking to expand the crowded teeth away. And so we basically expand until there's no crowding. We also expand until we have a proper arch form. We expand until we have an appropriate arch width. We expand until we have an appropriate buccal lingual inclination. The three things that we talk about are improper arch form, improper arch width, and improper buccal lingual inclination. So since clear aligners are capable, what we end up doing is we expand until that patient has a healthy occlusion. So for different people, it's different numbers. He happened to be starting at 28 millimeters. So if we can get him between 35 and 39, we have a healthy range. So the idea is what, where do you meet your patient? What, where are they at the start? And then what do you need to get to to deliver a healthy occlusion? And then the idea there is you're going to deliver the amount of expansion that's appropriate for that patient. And it may be a significant amount. And there are cases where we only do a few millimeters of expansion given the mild credentials. Then there are patients like this. 
But the outcome here, again, it's not an outlier. This is the norm. This is a consistently and repeatable type of result when you have the right technique. And this was done by a teenager in 36 straight aligners without refinement and without auxiliary. I know everyone's curious to see about that lower tooth, number 29. I know, so my favorite tooth in the world. <laughs> right, because a lot of people <laughs> would think, and I used to think before I met you, um, Dr. Moralia, was that this would need an extraction. I mean, that's what you would tend to think if you didn't know about expansion, right? That out of school, would you, would you yeah. think this out of school that that would be an expansion case? I don't no. want to put you on the spot. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I left dental school in 1993 <laughs> and for 10 straight years, I would have looked at that picture and said, wow, if you just take out number 29, the rest of the teeth will line up because that little bit of crowding will add up to the space there. And I could line up those teeth by taking that tooth out. And that, that would have been the first decade, 93 to 2003. And all that was, was I had no clue. Right. Now, 2004, I started learning about clear aligners and then getting an education in what expansion orthodontics has to offer. And next thing you know, you find out, you learn a lot about developing the arch and then you learn that the, so the appliances that you're using, clear aligners from Invisalign here, they're totally capable of developing the arch. And so we have a photograph coming up, which is the end result of expansion alone with clear aligners and no IPR. This is, a, this is not an IPR case. And as most cases are not IPR cases. And so not only didn't we extract any teeth, you can count them all, they're all there. But the clear aligners were one to 36. He wears them straight through. He gets no elastic. That tooth doesn't have an attachment on it. You know, and he walks himself from one to the next all the way through. So this is what one aligner to the next can deliver when you have a wonderful technique in place because it doesn't happen by snapping your fingers or by magic. You, you really need a nice technique. Now you put a nice technique into that clean check because we're, if we're talking about Invisalign, the fancy word is clean check. But when you make the right path for this patient, you should expect this to track perfectly and have yourself done at 36 aligners. And so when he opens up that entire arch, now you have the opportunity for a proper arch form at an appropriate arch with, with perfect buccal lingual inclination, meaning the back teeth are no longer leaning in, they're upright, so that when he bites down, he will deliver vertical load. Vertical load is what we were built to withstand. And basically that beautiful vertical load translates into Vertical load gives the tooth the opportunity to transmit that force to the bone. So now you've got your tooth through root to bone. And next thing you know, you've got somebody who's got a healthy protected bite for you know decades to come with little change. You know that, the left side of the screen where all of the back teeth are leaning in and collapsed, that's loaded with interferences. So on the left side of the screen, when that patient bites down, he hits in all the wrong places. He has interferences everywhere. He has premature contact everywhere. And of course, with the teeth leaning in so far, all of that load has, the majority of it is a horizontally loaded tooth, which we know is going to cause a lot of damage over time. And the damage, what is it going to be? Recession, abfraction, enamel wear and tear. He's going to grind the heck out of his teeth, that's for sure. So you have all of this ready to deteriorate. Meanwhile, if we just move it all, upright all the back teeth, align all the front teeth, you could have a beautifully connected, protected occlusion that has all of the components of that nice, healthy, typodont-like bite. And it all begins with the foundation, proper arch form, proper arch width, and proper inclination. Now, all of those back teeth take that eight millimeter pathway to be where they belong, and the gum and the bone remodel with them. So you have a beautiful amount of gingival tissue this is someone we treated, I think it's eight years ago now. I can't even believe it because you feel like everything was yesterday, but this is probably eight years out of treatment. And to this day, you just wear the Invisalign Vivera to bed every night and nothing's changed uh, in his mouth since. So you get the opportunity to open it up. And then one of the considerations is the view. Like you can see in this ClinCheck model, how the teeth are going to play. You could play that, right? It's going to move. Yeah, I'd play it. Uh -huh. So, you know, the back's going to widen. Tooth number 29 is the favorite one to watch because you're going to see that tooth just take its pathway all the way up. And it begins moving on the first aligner. Everybody's moving out and upright. And all of a sudden, the chamber for the tongue is getting much bigger. So you're, you're solving a patient's malocclusion. You're delivering more room for the tongue. You're correcting that terrible overjet that he had there too. And next thing you know, what you have is someone who, when they close their mouth, their lips will seal at rest. The tongue has a beautiful chamber to fall into going forward. 
and the air is going to pass better behind it. So you're improving someone's ability to breathe well by delivering proper lip seal at the front and a better space for the tongue to live in. So it just so happens that having a good occlusion corresponds with having the right amount of room for the tongue. If your teeth are where they belong, you have the right amount of space for your tongue. If your teeth are in the crowded deep bite, you have a lot less room for the tongue. The crowded deep bite, the sides collapse and we overclose. So you think about the crowded deep bite is a compactor in both directions. The patient loses tongue space this way by the collapse in of the teeth and they lose their space this way by the overclosing into the tongue. And next thing you know, basically you're just squeezing the tongue into a posteriorly displaced position. So what a wonderful opportunity to be able to use clear aligners, Invisalign, and take a patient who looks like that to what we're about to see is a finished smile. And there's nothing wrong with a mouthful of teeth. A little whitening gel goes in there to lighten up the teeth. You get some stain off. Everybody likes a little whitening gel. But all of a sudden you have a mouthful of teeth. He smiles gently and shows you all the teeth. That's not even an exerted forced smile. It's just a casual, easy smile. And what do you get? A view molar to molar. His teeth fill his mouth. And it would be very difficult to do that with a restorative or aesthetic technique. If we're looking at the left side picture and say, oh, you know, we don't want to wait 12 months to do this movement. Can we have a set of veneers? Now, veneers are beautiful and people work magical things with them, you know, and, the, and then we get beautiful results. But there's no way to take that picture on the left and make it the picture on the right with a set of veneers. The porcelain will be excessive. It'll be too thick. We'll have aggressive reductions of the front teeth. We're going to have buildup on the right and left. So there's such a compromise trying to do that with a, an aesthetic and restorative technique, whereas all we needed to do was move his teeth where they belong. We get a beautiful occlusion for it, and we get a kid who's totally confident, totally secure, very happy, now smiling to show his teeth. So you, you created a, a wonderful occlusion, but all of the things that followed with it, the tongue space, the nose breathing from mouth breathing, the confidence and security. And then of course, you know, when you have that ability to smile you can change your, your social life. And next thing you know, you're, you're enjoying your senior year of high school instead of kind of struggling through it. So you go from struggling to thriving. You go from unhealthy to healthy. You go from insecure and shy to out and about and just totally confident and secure. And next thing you know, you have a, a really happy patient on your hands. Happy and healthy. What a, what a wonderful outcome. Tooth movement. And it makes you want to go to work every day, right? Yeah, that'll keep you coming back to the office. Okay. So let's take a look um, at another, unfortunately, unhealthy um, man since we first met him. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. So our buddy here, you can see from the smile alone, well, we're narrow and we're crowded. And so when we're thinking about arch form, there's no way to look at that smile and say, this will be a beautiful arch form like a dome, you know, that beautiful dome we expect to see. That won't be in there. We have that crowded malocclusion again, and here it is. Tooth number seven happens to be hiding, and we have other photos coming to kind of show where that is. But the idea here is this photograph alone allows you to make a real confident diagnosis that you have an improper arch form at an improper arch width. It shouldn't be a big reach to say he's going to be narrow. And if we're thinking about 35 to 39 millimeters, where that's an appropriate distance across the arch between the molars, this guy's going to measure below that. And so with a significant amount of crowding, you're going to be narrow. And then, of course, we can see that buccal lingual inclination. We look into the lower teeth are completely leaning on the tongue, but the top teeth follow them. The top teeth are angled this way. So it creates that open buccal corridor, back teeth leaning in. The bottom teeth are leaning in, and the top teeth are leaning in. It's a terrible malocclusion. And so this is going to age poorly. You know, this is the kind of malocclusion that deteriorates. And we're going to see in the other photos, this is someone who's already 26 years old, but has an amount of damage. So we take a look at the incisal edges, the lower incisors, all of a sudden, we have wear and tear, the dentin is starting to show. So we've got someone doing their bruxing, clenching or grinding. The first molars, they got there earlier, but now from age six or seven to 28, or here we are at, at 26 uh, years old, 26 years old when we meet them, we already have the buccal cusps worn off and then a little bit of an indentation into the dentin. So here we have someone who we would easily think about, oh, well, that's a lot of clenching, grinding, we'll make a night guard. You know, we would think about a night guard. We have to protect those teeth because 
If that's how your teeth look and you're 26, how are you going to be 75, 80, 85? And so by the decade, this mouth is going to deteriorate. The lingual tori are being built as we speak. Here come the lingual tori in there. So there's a lot of, a lot of horizontal force on those back teeth. There's a lot of activity of the jaws. And it didn't start last year or the year before when we think about someone like this. If this patient's never had orthodontic care, well, these are where the teeth came in. They, they didn't come in perfectly. He didn't have a typodont at eight to 12 as his teeth came in. And then all of a sudden from 12 to 26, they all collapsed. His teeth erupted one by one into a crowded, deep bite, narrow malocclusion. And of course, from that time on, he's been suffering. There it is. And there it is, another favorite tooth. And this is our favorite letter. Another lateral. extraction, right? Another, another extraction, get that out of there. So the idea is improper arch form. We've got that omega shaped arch, improper arch width. You know, he has about 32 millimeters between his upper first molars. And so 32 to 40 is a long way off. And so he's got, you know, beautiful tooth size. His centrals are beautiful teeth. He is slightly above average tooth size. So here you have someone with full size laterals, and this complete collapse of the upper arch into the lingual. Even the mid palatal suture's got a little curve to it. So you got that little curve into the incisive papilla as eight and nine are leaning over. Seven is completely trapped out of there. So this 26 year old had no interest in wearing braces. And of course, um, having worked with clear aligners, by the time I met him, I heard already had about seven years experience. And so we met him in 2010. So in 2010, we meet this young man and he knew he didn't want braces. We already knew what the aligners were capable of doing. And we, we went into his case without any IPR. And of, and of course, without extraction, I don't, I don't take out teeth. I don't think about taking out teeth. The, um, the idea is that you have an opportunity to treat a patient depending upon your focus. And so I tend to focus on the foundation, not so much the teeth. And if we just help develop the arch out, we should be able to treat our patients without extraction. Uh, and then, of course, then the IPR becomes an issue. We can think about IPR, you know, there it exists and it can be a helpful tool. And IPR has a place. There are, you know, places where a little IPR can come in handy. But I don't have the, let's say, technique of doing a lot of IPR on patients. And in, in most cases, we don't do any. The idea is the more you're willing to treat the arch form, the arch width, and the inclination, the more movement you would do. The more movement there is, the less IPR you need. So we don't do any IPR for him either. These two cases are both examples of the, the power that these Invisalign clear liners have in developing the full arch uh, and the ability to do it without extraction and without IPR. And so these are aligner alone techniques, same as the previous patient, where there are no elastics involved, there are no expanders involved, there are no mini implants involved, no auxiliaries other than a clear aligner technique to get these teeth out where they belong. So we think about a case like this to go right to the opportunity of one aligner to the next, and he's gonna use 33 of them to get to here. So 33 aligners later, he's here. And you know, at the time, 2010 to 11, was the time where the word refinement was used. So when you're looking at that photograph, he's able to do that in exactly 33 aligners without a refinement to get to this stage. So now we have the first molars rotated out to position. We have a beautiful arch form at an appropriate arch width. And when he's measured, and in fact, when we, when we spend a bigger time frame in a course and we open up the ClinCheck to go through the diagnostics in there, we get the ruler out and we do a measurement. He begins at 32, he ends at 39. So it's a, it's a full seven millimeters of first molar rotating and moving out. And next thing you know, you've got a beautiful amount of expansion, enough that tooth number seven fits into the arch. Now eight and nine with the expand and procline with the developing of the arch, even the mid palatal suture starts to straighten out. It had a full curve through the incisive papilla. So now if the upper arch is gonna give you this amount of change, you're gonna find a corresponding match in the lower arch. And of course, you know that's where our photos are headed in that we can take a look at the lower and it opens up and goes all the way out to where it belongs. So now you have your you know, beautiful arch form at an appropriate arch width and that inclination is now corrected. Instead of having excessive lingual inclination, now you have teeth that have beautiful, appropriate, and slight inclination, which means when he closes his bite together, he delivers vertical load to all of his back teeth. So we treated him from 2010 to 11. He's going on a decade 
since treatment, and he, all he does is wear his Vivera every night to bed. And then the idea is that uh, clear aligner alone, an expansive technique with the proper technique and you know, a patient who is compliant and will deliver the correct wear time, of course, all of a sudden you can have the result like this. And this is done without a refinement. This is done one aligner to the next, 33 aligners later, the patient's finished and getting retainers. And now you have someone who has a beautiful occlusion. So there's gonna be less wear and tear and you would expect his mouth to age appropriately at this point. He can use it to eat the food for decades with little to no change. That's kind of how the mouth was designed in that if you have all of your teeth where they belong coming together with you know, beautiful protected occlusion, what ends up happening is that you chew a lot of food throughout your lifetime and the mouth deteriorates very slowly. The changes in the mouth are small with a good occlusion. When you have a bad occlusion, in particular, that crowded deep bite type occlusion, you get more rapid changes. And next thing you know, the, we start seeing recession, that fraction, enamel wear and tear in our 20s. This is someone who's in 26. So it's not uncommon. The, the general dentist knows that if they're looking at people between 25 and 30, it's fair enough that you're going to find a lot of recession, that fraction, and wear and tear of enamel and other issues, but in the 20s and then 30s, 40s, sure every decade. By the time you're 25, you've already had this occlusion for almost 15 years. And so 15 years in bad occlusion is a lot of damage. That's going to wear out before it's time. One of the questions while we have this slide up is, can you expand when large tori are present? So I sure. Know and so, yeah, the, you know, the, the tori are sitting in the lingual. You're looking to do some nice dental alveolar, you know, all of the expansion. And we, we're using the word expansion, but the idea is predominantly it's uprighting. And so as you're doing your beautiful expansion or uprighting technique, you're getting the remodeling of the alveolus so that everything follows it. out. Yeah. And so you're going to have the, the same amount of gum tissue. You're not going to lose any gum tissue. If you have recession or clefting, you'll probably get an improvement. It will heal. And sometimes you get a, an improvement in the gum tissue when you upright the teeth, because what you've done there is you've converted a horizontally loaded tooth, which is having the recession because of that to a vertically loaded tooth, which is protected and you can allow the gum tissue to heal. So the tori don't really interfere with anything. Uh, probably the only thing the tori could do is maybe uh, throw a, a little bit of a monkey wrench into getting an impression. And so if you had to modify the tray, let's say if you had to take a PVS to get your aligners made, you might modify your tray just to take a comfortable impression. Now, if you've graduated to digital dentistry already, you've got yourself a nice itero element and you're scanning well, then you scan without any regard to the tori. So the only thing I can think of in the tori being an issue is maybe you have to adjust your you know, tray to take a PVS, but once you get that PVS, you're good. And so another good reason for a scanner, you don't have to bother with the trays anymore. Exactly, exactly. I was gonna say yeah, PVS, what's that? A, what's tori that? are not a problem, yeah. Okay, okay, terrific. So let's take a look at this beautiful result. Yeah, so we, we take him through, you know, his 33 aligners, and here you are a year later, and next thing you know, you got a beautifully protected occlusion. He has all the credentials, a beautiful arch form, a beautiful arch width, a beautiful gum line. He's got everything in place in 2011, and then, you know, this is someone we photograph over the years, but the idea is this is going to remain healthy and stable for a good long time. This was the bite we were intended to have. This is looking more like a typodont on the right side of the screen, not to mention that that right side of the screen has all of those teeth out in a beautiful position without any IPR. And next thing you know, you have a beautifully set up vertical load on all your back teeth. So every one of the interferences that might've been present on the left side of the screen is gone. So what was interference full, premature contact full, you know, a very bad occlusion on the left side, when you upright all those back teeth and you deliver that cusp into groove or cusp into marginal ridge, next thing you know, you, you really have a, a well-connected and vertically loaded bite that when you do all of your final analysis, it should need little to no equilibration. You should be in a spot where you have everything that you wanted by tooth movement. And you know, last but not least, a very happy patient. Just again, to sprinkle a little whitening gel in there, they all seem to love that very much. You reduce the shade on the teeth, you've put together a smile that's appealing, your patient's happy, they're comfortable. So you have happy and comfortable in the patient. You know they're healthy because not only did you deliver a beautiful bite that's going to last for decades with little to no change, you've also got more room for the tongue. And anytime you give a patient's tongue more room, good things are going to happen. 
And the opposite is true. Anytime you reduce the room for the tongue, bad things are gonna happen for that patient. The, the tongue should have as much room as possible, which technically kind of means you, you want all of your teeth where they belong. So in the end, we'd love to have all 32 teeth where they belong. That's someone who is fully grown, fully developed, and in a position where the tongue has every bit of room that it should have to be kind of forward and high in a position where the air can flow behind it beautifully. It should be Can no you surprise. advance, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, go ahead. Can you advance the mandible with clear aligners? Well, that, the question is asked a little bit awkwardly. The idea is the clear aligners aren't advancing the mandible. The idea is that when you're developing the upper arch, you are freeing a trapped mandible. And so when you're thinking about that crowded deep bite malocclusion, that mandible is trapped back. So crowding and narrow. Now narrow traps a mandible back in and of itself. The moment you have your canines narrow and your teeth are crowded, your mandible is basically the victim of where the top teeth are. So when you're thinking about how this all works, well, the, the upper jaw is really the criminal and the lower jaw is really the victim. So the upper jaw determines or allows the lower to go somewhere. So basically the mandible can only go where the upper allows it to. And if the upper jaw is narrow, that mandible is trapped back. When the upper jaw is completely narrow and crowded, all of a sudden you have a mandible that has to fit behind it. And since we look at our patients and recognize most of them are class one or two, the mandible is always behind the upper jaw. Rarely is the mandible class three, which is in front of the upper jaw. So that's a rare animal right there, the class three. So for all our class one and two patients, basically what we have is a mandible trapped behind an underdeveloped upper jaw. Now, when you're opening up that upper jaw wider and forward, so expand is the fancy word for wider, procline is forward. So we're doing a lot of expansion. The back teeth are tipping up and getting wider, but there's also a little bit of procline. The front teeth go forward a little bit. So expand and procline is you know, opening up the upper arch, but the mandibles will follow it forward. In other words, any amount of crowding or narrow traps a mandible. And next thing you know, as you open it all up, that mandible is gonna follow forward. So the, the question was maybe a little more jumping to the end, do clear aligners advance the mandible? Well, it's more the technique. So if you have the right technique, uprighting the back teeth, proclining the front teeth, the development of the upper jaw is what re will release a trapped mandible. So the technique will do it. Now, the good news is that clear aligners are built to upright the posterior teeth and procline the front teeth. So when you have a tool that can do that technique, then you have the opportunity to free or release a mandible that might be trapped. Great, thank you. Okay, so let's take a look at the before and after. It's amazing how his whole face changed. Oh yeah, another full smile. And so with all that dental alveolar change, you get a full smile and in a nice, light, easy smile that's not exerted at all, we can see back to the second molar. And so all of a sudden you can see all of his teeth right across the arch instead of open buccal corridors. And the idea is that we probably should be thinking about beyond the teeth. When you're looking at these two people, where's the tongue fit? You know, how does the tongue fit on the left side of the screen? It's so collapsed, where would his tongue be? It would be posteriorly displaced, the fancy word for, you know, back. And so posteriorly displaced, but on the right side of the screen, when you open everything up, the tongue has room to come forward. So if you give the tongue in a space, it'll take it, that's for sure. So now you've got a happy kid who's comfortable and you know he's healthy because you delivered a beautiful bite and you expect him to wear his retainer every night, which he does. And now we're ticking up to the 10th year, 10 year anniversary coming for treating that. Wow. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks. I didn't get any older. I hope I didn't get any older. Just <laughs> It's funny um, because we're getting a, a lot of questions on, well, how do you do this? And as much wow. as we would love to like, like wish, um, wave our magic wand and, and tell everyone, it, it takes time to teach this. So that was the birth of our Airway Health Solutions mini residency. Um, when the adult portion, we teach this technique. Um, and you, you do it in such a way where it's easy to understand, it's implementable, and you also um, correlate the removable expansion. So we had a lot of questions on when do you use a removable expander? When do you use aligners? What's the combination? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's something that we just can't um, conquer in, in the chat here, <laughs> you know, uh, with, a with a casual conversation. So we do hope if you're interested in learning this technique that you consider um, attending 
one of our mini residencies. And actually we have one coming up uh, 2020. That'll be our last one, hard to believe, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. November 20th. So reach out to me if you'd like to join us. And then we will be having them monthly in 2021. I don't know if I told you that yet, Dr. Murata. <laughs> <But, laughs> yes. Um, yes. <laughs> With the exception of um, August and December. So we'll have 10 right. in 2021. So we're always here <laughs> if you need us um, and you can mix and match the dates. You can either take just the adult or you can take the pediatric, but we do recommend you take two um, in, in, in completion to build the whole puzzle from start to finish from pediatric dentistry all the way to adult dentistry. And I know Dr. Morelia, you listened last week. We had Dr. Scott Siegel on. Um, yes. I hope, if I hope I do see some listeners here from last week as well. If you didn't have a chance to hear Dr. Scott Siegel, um, I highly recommend you go to our YouTube channel and listen to hear his uh, take on this narrow arches and tongue tie and adult and how it's all, all correlated. It's all connected. But what really struck me was his um, kind of call to action that there is such a high demand for airway dentists. I get so many DMs on Facebook. Uh, so many patients are looking for airway centric dentists. So if you're looking to grow your yeah. practice, help your patients become healthy patients, happy patients, it's certainly a win-win. You want to tell us a little bit about uh, the residency uh, as an overarching and anything I may have missed? Yeah. So, you know, because this journey started in 2004 or five and all of a sudden you're treating adults, then children, and then everybody, and with a similar growth and development expansive philosophy, um, all of a sudden you put a lot of pieces together and you draw from a lot of mentors. And, all, and next thing you know, you have some, you know, most incredible results that are life-changing for a lot of patients. And then there's the need to share it. And the idea is uh, all of this kind of came about because there's only so many people I could have an effect on in Westchester County, New York, you know, and while it's a, an honor and it feels nice that people would travel from wherever to come be treated by me, if I could teach other uh, dentists to do techniques that could develop a child's jaws to fully accommodate all of the teeth, and if that child you know, had their opportunity early, there's a really good chance you'd have all 32 teeth in place. And so we have the kind of short goal of helping children grow and develop fully so that they can have all 32 teeth in place it just so turns out it's all related to the symptoms. And so that underdeveloped jaw structure can deliver a lot of breathing issues. And so if you've got breathing issues, you've got sleeping issues. If you've got sleeping issues, you're an unhealthy child. So because it's all tied together, it's, um, it's hard to ignore the symptoms that the kids have, especially when you begin your, your growth and development opportunity with them and you see those symptoms disappear and the parents you know, can't thank you enough for taking away some of the symptoms they've been struggling with for years. Now, taking an unhealthy child is probably one of the most, uh, to, to healthy is one of the most rewarding things you could ever do. And, and dentists have the opportunity to do that. But we meet a lot of adults who didn't have this opportunity. And so we need something for them as well. Not every adult wants to be wearing a CPAP machine for the rest of their life. And some of the options you know, aren't wonderful for adults who have underdeveloped jaws, lots of crowded malocclusions. And we have opportunity to help them there. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna be treated out of their OSA while that happens sometimes. That's not always the goal. The idea is we gotta start somewhere and starting somewhere means giving an adult an opportunity for growth and development that might involve clear aligners, that could involve expansion appliances, just of the removable variety, that could involve nasal techniques, that could involve frenum release and myofunctional therapy. And these apply to the kids too, but the idea is when you get enough of the pieces of the puzzle, and even though it might've taken me 10 years to get to the point where I felt like I've got a good routine now, I can have a significant impact on any patient I treat. Now you wanna share it because now you know that these patients are in every single community all throughout the country and you build a two day program. And then you get connected with Lauren, somebody like Lauren who can help to build a program like that. And then, you know, help branch it out to other people. So I'm really happy to be partnered up with you in the teaching of this. It's an incredible two day journey and you, you leave those two days with the how. So there's very little of the why we've got it in there, but it's a technique course where you learn how to treat those kids, how to treat those teens, how to treat those adults. The next week you start looking at diagnosing, taking records, consulting and treating. 
And so I'm very proud of the program that we built. And we have taught enough dentists to now already have feedback from them. And when you get feedback from people you taught, the difference that it's made in a child or a teen or an adult's life, then you kind of get inspired to do more. So I'm happy to teach and I'm looking forward to teaching more people. Every patient should have the opportunity for expansive techniques that are in the growth and development category. Terrific. And just a couple more announcements. Um, we have, we're going to be continuing these airway health solutions conversations because now I don't know what to do on Wednesday nights <laughs> besides <laughs> this, but um, I'm super excited to have Dr. Felix Liao, um, our partner in crime on December 2nd. He, you probably know the book. Um, I think I got it right. Three foot cage, six foot tiger. I always tend to flip that around. Um, <laughs> yeah. But License to Thrive, we had the pleasure of reading the manuscript, so really excited to um, have Dr. Liao on, on December 2nd. So I'll be sending a follow-up email to anyone who registered with that link as well. And we're looking forward to many more airway conversations in 2021, so we will keep you posted. Um, also, if you're looking for some patient education and tools, um, please follow us on Facebook. We do provide resources as well as Instagram. YouTube is where you can find the recordings of many, many of these chats. If you miss them, I always upload them um, about a week or so later. And then I'm going through expansion myself. So if you wanted to follow my blog, um, you could do that either via YouTube or if you prefer reading, I have my written blog. Um, but it's patient friendly on purpose because I know as a hygienist, I always wanted resources for my patients. So now I, I kind of created that um, as, as a story. They like following a real person. I get a lot of um, feedback from Facebook from patients. So um, please feel free to follow us and take advantage of that. Here is our contact information as well as our partner in crime, um, Kevin Ollendorf. We couldn't do our mini residency without him because he fabricates the appliances that we use. Um, we use Myobrace for the children and then we use the um, Ollendorf Appliance Labs and any type of aligner that you are comfortable using just as long as we expand with them, all right? There were some questions on that, Dr. Moralia. Um, you know, I know you use Invisalign, but it doesn't necessarily have to be Invisalign, correct? That's right, yeah, it's more about the technique. You know, while I have used Invisalign exclusively and it's very capable, um, I think if you had an, another aligner brand you were comfortable with and you practicing, you know, a good technique, you probably can get similar results. Um, but I, I don't, I don't use the other brands, but I, I believe they're capable. Okay, terrific. Um, so let's go. We're going to have rapid fire here. <laughs> this is kind of okay. how we end the night of some Q&A. We did answer a lot of the questions as we went along, but some came up in okay. the chat. Um, what's the youngest age that you can do aligner expansion in? So I am very comfortable with aligners at the age of nine and above. So I have done my fair amount of mixed dentition. And so that's more of a compliance issue. You can use the aligners at any age. They're, they're a dental alveolar tooth movement you know, device. And so the idea is what, what level are you comfortable with the compliance? Nine years old has been working great and up. I'm sure at some point I'll start, I'll start an eight or a seven or a six. At some point you try other ages and you work your way down. Um, I don't know that I would dive into mixed dentition without a fair amount of, let's say, more uh, training and having some, you know, good education before just doing it to do it. But in the mixed dentition, clear aligners are wonderful for opening up the arch. Great. And do you replace night guards post-treatment? Yeah, I don't have a single patient in 17 years of using Invisalign where they got a night guard back. And so, you know, anybody could imagine how many patients have night guards in a dental practice. It's probably a significant percentage, but... Not, not one of the patients that I have treated with clear aligners uh, gets their night guard back. And so after treatment, when they have a beautiful occlusion and they wear their uh, Vivera, if I'm using Invisalign, it would be Vivera retainer to bed. That's the only thing they wear to sleep. Now, what's very nice to see, uh, having used Vivera since it's been around, it's got to be since 2010, I believe. So I'm probably going on 10 years of using Vivera. The Vivera, as a retainer at night, does not get worn out. Uh, and so it's very protective. And as you recognize that you've developed a beautiful occlusion and the tongue has more room, if you're breathing better, there's a fair chance you're going to do less clenching and grinding. And next thing you know, all of a sudden you see your retainer looks the same six months later, a year later, two years. So we have a fair number of patients who wear a single Vivera for two years before switching to the next one. So Vivera can be an eight-year retainer, two years each. 
with the, you know, as long as you've developed a beautiful technique and have your, you know, occlusion corrected and tongue space. If you've got both of those, you're in great shape. So no night guards after, you know, an expansive technique. Okay, and our friend, Dr. Jordan Dupree wants to know what are clear aligners main strengths and main weaknesses in terms of moving teeth? Sure, so the, the uh, probably the main strength for clear aligners is expansion. They are an expansion device. So when you think about, you know, the, what, what capabilities there are, the, the most predictable thing that you could do with clear aligners would be to expand, to develop the arch width. So alignment is also wonderful. You can, you know, very predictably align teeth. You know, um, when you start thinking about molar crossbite, there's a weakness right there. So clear aligners uh, struggle with molar crossbite. Molar crossbites usually do not correct with clear aligner alone. And so when we think about using clear aligners alone, developing the arch, expansion, beautiful, alignment, beautiful, little bits of intrusion, no problem, uh, little bits of extrusion, no problem, you have attachments so you can get your leveling of things. But when you think about a molar crossbite, I start thinking about removable expansion appliances. So molar crossbite would be a tough one for, you know, clear aligners. Okay. Um Someone just wants to know what size elastics do you recommend for patients? So I don't really use elastics. And so, you know, the, if we were thinking about that first patient where you had a significant overjet, that was done without elastics. And so when developing the full arch form, the arch width, you, you shouldn't have to do much with the elastics. And so I use them so infrequently, but that's case dependent too. If, if you're gonna be, if I'm involved with elastics in a few cases a year, they could be quarter inch, they could be three sixteenths, they might be one eighth, they could be medium, they could be heavy. So not only do you have sizes, but you have you know light, medium, and heavy. And so th that's near impossible to say what is regular, it's depending upon the case, but rarely do I use them. Okay. Are there, other than more room for the tongue, are there other benefits to the airway when expanding with aligners? Yeah, lip seal is a big one because when, when you've got a, a when you have a crowded malocclusion, there's a fair chance that you might have some overjet in there. And if you've got a deep bite with some overjet, you might have some difficulty with lip seal at rest. And so when the entire set of teeth is off and the bite is off and your musculature is off, if you don't have lip seal at rest, then the mouth is automatically leaking. And so, you know, the, the patients who come to mind right away are the ones with some excess overjet. And with a little more overjet, all of a sudden at rest, your lips are apart. And next thing you know, you got air there. So you could have an improvement in the lip position, that's for sure. How do you correct the buckly tip second molars using Invisalign? The buckly tip mm -hmm. second molars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I haven't met one yet. <laughs> I know, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. But I can see where the perspective comes because it's that omega shape arch. I think the question is coming from the omega shape arch where, where the second molars are out far and the arch is like that. And then, but when I see an omega shaped arch that has the second molars kicked out, I have a different perspective of that patient. The, the patient who has an omega shaped arch with the second molar kicked out, those second molars are almost wide enough. We're expanding that tooth too. None of the teeth are brought towards the tongue. So the technique involves every tooth going wider. And uh, those two patients we showed were both good examples of that. Neither one of those patients had the second molars tucking in to the lingual. Even though at the beginning, the perspective is that they're buccally positioned or wider, that arch is so collapsed that even the second molar is narrow, it's just wider than the first molar. So all of the teeth are going wider. I don't have an example of a case where the second molars are brought lingual to align with the first molars. The first molars and second molars are both expanding, just the first molars are gonna go farther. So it's expansion of all of the teeth, all of the teeth move away from the tongue. Are you moving away from less attachments? Oh yeah, and so when you, when, when you get, this is the progression that's happened for me is that the moment you have your technique and you recognize what your you know, aligner is capable of doing, and you have a technique that is simple and primarily crown movement in the uprighting category. So now I already have categories as I've worked my way down. Over the last five years, I started reducing my attachment count. And now I have already treated 
more than 50 patients without any attachments, but I also have at least 50 patients where we had just four. And those four, the most common four that we end up with are the canines. Four canines get their little attachments and boy, you can treat almost every case. So what I've done over the last few years is get down to four attachments and in a number of cases, none. So the good news is there's a wonderful opportunity to reduce your attachment count as opposed to increase your attachment count. Now, the more complicated and difficult the movements are gonna be in the ClinCheck dictate the attachments. And so I'm not looking for complicated or difficult movements, I'm looking for simple. I like a simple uprighting technique and expand and procline is powerful enough. I already know what it can do. So I'm interested in the simplest, most predictable path because that allows me to reduce the attachment count. So now if I can get myself out of the IPR, I'm happy, my patient's happy. If I can get myself down to four attachments for most cases and in some none, that's happiness. And so we never put on molar attachments. I don't use them at all. The next molar attachment I put on would be the first one. So I don't use molar attachments. I know they're popular today, but I don't have any desire to be adding difficulty to my technique. So I'm not interested in molar attachments, but most of the premolar attachments are unnecessary. So you get down to a technique where canines only, and now you have the opportunity to figure out, hey, do I even need those for some cases? So reduced attachment count is next, yeah, that's what's coming next. I would yeah, love to Yeah, and teach our friend and colleague, Dr. Uh, Terry Coddington, said less attachments, little or no IPR, love it. So we are at thank 901. Um, I just want to thank you so much. This, I can't believe how fast the time goes every week. Yeah. Um, but always, I really appreciate your wisdom, your knowledge, and sharing it, you know, because you could just be home watching. I don't know what's on now, but oh, I know the music for it. Right. Okay. <laughs> and and you choose to um to give us your time. So we really appreciate that and hope you all enjoy tonight. We I think we covered most of the questions. Um may not be the exact question you had, but hopefully it was in context when we reviewed our case reviews. So uh, we look forward to seeing you. We're going to have a couple weeks break. Um, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And we'll see you December 2nd. If you are interested in our course, please reach out to us. The last one is November 20th for the adult um, session. All okay. right. It's a wrap. Anything else, Dr. Moralia? Did I add? I think we're good. Thank you, okay. everyone. Have a good evening. All right. Have a nice night. Thank you. Take care.